welcome to episode 109 of the Power Square LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn in Breezy Napa Valley. Breezy Napa Valley. I like the sound of that. It's windy. It's usually smoky or cold. Breezy's not so bad. We don't actually like wind up here because usually it's accompanied by extremely hot weather and then you've got fire danger. But given the time of year, we don't have that problem. So it's all good. <laughs> well, assuming you're not exposed to the wind, you're sitting inside doing this with me. I imagine you've got at least one hand full. Yes, and this time it's an homage to San Francisco. Nice. It's kind of a variant on the uh, sidecar drink, which is cognac in it that I don't like. <laughs> and instead, this is a cable car, which has got Captain Morgan and orange curacao and a bunch of sugar and fruit in it. It's pretty good. Uh, I'd have a sip. I'm not sure I'd make it all the way to the bottom of the glass. I can't make the so ice. Can you rattle it? I tried, but it's enough. So we'll put in some sound effects in post. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm like, <laughs> there you can kind of hear it. Well, you don't want me to rattle mine because I'd need a carpet cleaner. I am drinking a, uh, a little flashback to my time in Portugal at the end of last year. I've had a craving for port. And so I went and ordered myself a bottle of Graham 20 year tawny port. You're into those tawny ports, which I reject, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm into 20 year old anything for the most part. So yeah, a tawny port. Go for it. Let's keep with, let's stick with the port. <laughs> Fair enough. But it is pretty good. Um, it's an acquired taste. I really didn't like it all that much and it slowly grew on me and uh, now, I'm, now I'm a fan. And I need to give a shout out too, because what I was hoping I would be drinking tonight is going to have to wait till tomorrow. Uh, a dear friend of mine, former student of mine, um, just got her final confirmation for Columbia Law School. And that sent is me an awesome some achievement. booze as a celebratory thank you. What did she send you? She sent me two things, um, a bottle of champagne and a really, really good bottle of tequila. But I had to push the delivery till tomorrow because we're doing this. And as you told me earlier, mm -hmm. the tequila she sent was uh, kind of like a higher level of Herradura and Nejo, which is what I was drinking last week in the margarita I had. There you go. Yeah. She's got good taste. I think I don't she's know confused why she's you friend. with me because I, I'll drink bottom shelf tequila. <laughs> you could ring yeah. out a bar mat and I'd drink it. With her taste that good, I'm surprised that you guys are friends. But anyway. <laughs> She's elevating me day by day. <laughs> anyway, I'm a big, big fan of hers. I won't mention her name, but if she's listening to this, which she might be. Uh, Let's hope so. I hope she knows that I'm grateful. As you should be. And we're always happy to receive uh, gifts of alcohol from fans and friends. That's correct. <laughs> correct. I rarely give up my address, but I can be persuaded. <laughs> Uh, indeed. <laughs> well, John, this episode is about the proposal from the ABA to make a standardized test, uh, really specifically the LSAT, but also the GRE, an optional component as opposed to the current requirement it is. So I will say that the song we chose is actually the one that I made the choice of. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. For some reason, I've been listening to a lot of like weird synthy instrumental stuff, and that means you're going to end up listening to Alan Parsons Project. And years and years ago, they put out a uh, an album that actually had a lot of vocals on it. And one of the songs was Games People Play, mm. uh, which is kind of a big hit for them. And I thought it was kind of appropriate because in a way, it seems sometimes to me like the ABA and, and LSAC and even ETS are playing this kind of like game about what should be included, what tests could be used. And sometimes I feel like there's a lot of personal elements to this that maybe people in the public don't hear about, but I certainly do. So for some reason, I've been listening to a lot of Alan Parsons reason, uh, recently, and so that's the choice tonight, games people play. I, I'll confess that I'm not as familiar with them as you are, but I'll also confess that I'm more familiar with them than I thought I was. You started mm -hmm. actually giving me a little bit of the back catalog of old Alan Parsons, and some of the stuff that he, they have done, um, I was really shocked. Didn't they produce like some Pink Floyd stuff or some Beatles stuff? Like he's, he's done some pretty amazing things, if I'm not completely wrong. Yeah, Alan Parsons, the, the, the man, mm. actually was the sound engineer on Abbey Road by was. the Beatles, as well as Dark Side of the Moon by Pink Floyd, two of the best-selling albums in world history. Yeah, you didn't even need like, selling in that sentence, just two of the best. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're really talking about somebody who was there for like the iconic classics uh, of some of these bands. He didn't do a whole lot, you know, beyond that. He did some stuff with Paul McCartney and Wings in terms of like engineering. But then he kind of went on to his own thing. And he was really early, an early adopter of synth 
and synthesizers and synth music. And so they've got a, a number of really cool songs. They've got a song called I Robot. That was a big hit. They've got a whole album of instrumentals. But most people actually are familiar with Alan Parsons' project and don't realize it. And that is because it's their song, Serious, that the Chicago Bulls used to introduce like all those great championship teams. So that kind of like, da -na -na, that little yeah, song yeah. that goes on beforehand, that's Alan Parsons. And that's kind of like how a lot of people know him without realizing they know him. Interesting. So essentially the soundtrack to the greatest team in NBA history, the 92 Bulls. <laughs> uh, pretty much, yes. I'll see your Steph Curry and raise you one. You won't. I'm not. A, I mean, I like Steph. He's a good dude. I love a guy coming out of Davidson who's actually really successful and and uh, has such great you know movement off the ball and is such a good shooter. But he's not anywhere close to my favorite player. Well, there you go. All right. Well, enough about cocktails and songs. Let's get into it. We'll start with the LSAT world because there's a few, I think, quick updates that we can provide people. The first of which I'll handle. Let's talk about some of these upcoming test dates and releases and things just to make sure people are aware of the calendar uh, as it currently stands. And the first thing to know is that we're actually releasing this episode on the final makeup day from this April test, this slightly tumultuous April test week that we have just struggled through. That'll be the 10th today, if you're listening to this. Um, that's the last release day for April makeups, but all of the scores, whether taken from a makeup or the very first day of the April test a week and a half ago, all those release on uh, May 18th, so a little over a week at 9 a.m. So regardless of when you took your April exam, you'll get your scores on the 18th of May. All right, so we did a podcast that recapped the first three days of this test, that Friday, Saturday, Tuesday. Yes. Are we going to do a podcast that covers the Saturday that we just had as well as the Tuesday that this comes out? You know, here's where I'm leaning, and we'll see if you push me on one side or the other. Usually we don't do makeup test reviews because it's a very small group. It's hard to gather information sometimes, or it's such an obvious reuse that the information's already out there, and so we can just point people to other things. This is a different situation. I'm feeling, I mean quite a bit more charitable because there's such a large audience who was affected by some of the issues in April. So Dave, my impulse here is that I think we should do a makeup uh, recap as well. And I think your impulse is good here, John, mm. although I'm exhausted. Last week I worked 65 hours and that was before I worked another long day on Saturday. Yeah. I think it would be unfair to the people who had a technical interruption and then had to sit again a week later or, you know, nine days later for this to not get the the knowledge of like what their scale looks like, what was real, what was not. So I think we should go ahead and do it. Yeah. Um, one bit of sunshine in this is that we tracked it all this past weekend, this Saturday, first day of makeups. And I think we've got a very good understanding of exactly what happened. I feel really good uh, about what people have seen so far in terms of our understanding of it. So it should right. be maybe a shorter episode than normal, but at least it'll be chock full of confident information. Yeah. And we'll go ahead and record that Wednesday evening, I believe, That's barring probably. any kind of problems, and then release that on Thursday morning. There you go. So if you're taking the test today when this comes out, or if you took it on Saturday, we will, we got you covered. There you go. All right. What about the upcoming LSATs that we have? Sure. Um, you know, May was meant to be kind of a month off, but I find that laughable. <laughs> the next official test month is in June, with test dates beginning on June 10th, which is Friday, and Saturday, June 11th. I'm confident they're going to add a day to this, probably Tuesday the 14th, that's my guess. So possibly I, Monday. Possibly Monday the 13th, or even depends. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Okay. Yeah, they could do Sunday. That's maybe even the most likely of the, the lineup yeah. now. But I don't think it'll li be limited to just those two days, as the tests this year have so far. Uh, the registration for that is closed. It closed up two weeks ago. And the release for that test is June 29th, which is very near the end of the month. The good news for that is the scores for June will come out on the 29th. Then there's the August LSAT. So you get July off. Again, I'm doing air quotes. <laughs> then there's the August LSAT. The registration for that is June 30th. So you have about a day, day and a half with your score before you need to commit to August. Those test dates are uh, the 12th and 13th, Friday and Saturday of August. But again, I assume they're going to add at least one more day. And then you'll get your scores back the last day of August, Wednesday the 31st. Yeah, you get 39 hours or so to contemplate your score and then decide whether or not you need to go ahead and uh, take that August LSAT. All right, well, that's a good lineup there. We've also got, as usual, for all of you preparing, we've got a number of free seminars that are ongoing, and we've added an important one that relates to that August test. 
So as you kind of look at this, the day this comes out, we actually have a basic conditional reasoning webinar that is happening uh, tonight, mm -hmm. as it will turn out. Uh, on that Tuesday. And by the way, this, the kind of like sister or brother of that, the advanced conditional reasoning will come back up in about two weeks. Mm -hmm. It's actually May 25th. But for your purpose, John, and mine, uh, we're going to be doing two live webinars. And one we've talked about before, and that is the crystal ball webinar for the June LSAT. That is on Tuesday, May 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And you and I already could tell, given the gap between the June and the August test and the size of the test, that we were going to do a crystal ball for the August LSAT. And so we've made that decision and we've put that on the calendar. That is Monday, July 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern. And you can pre-register for all these webinars by going to our website, powerscore.com forward slash free seminars as one word. And you can register for each and every one of these. So if you are taking that June LSAT or the August LSAT or both, come join us and see what we have to say about possible test content, likely things that they'll cover, and possibly even predictions about the tests they might uh, reuse since we have a ton of information on that. Yeah. You know, I've said it before about this time of year that one of my favorite um, aspects of it is we have a lot of people that are new to LSAT prep in general, certainly new to us. So if you're a listener and you're like, what the hell is a crystal ball? Um, it's kind of hard to explain, frankly. Um, but in a nutshell, what we try to do is anticipate the features, the forms, the points of emphasis and de-emphasis that we expect to occur on the test that we're predicting. It's the crystal ball name. And we put together a collection of recommended problem sets for every section that we think are going to be the most relevant content for you to practice and master before you walk into the test. And without getting too maybe self-congratulatory, I can tell you, we're running on one heck of a track record here, buddy. Well, it lasts forever, but it's certainly running pretty strongly right now. And it's essentially a roadmap that helps you focus your studies. Mm -hmm. That's probably, I think, the most important thing. And the feedback that you and I both get after the test is some of the most gratifying that we hear about how helpful it was, how it saved people time, how it made them feel calmer about the test experience, which to me is the most important thing there. Yeah, I read a great quote from a student at the end of the April recap episode. I won't repeat it, but um, I hope she and her husband have reconciled since the test is now behind her, put it that way. Well, the quote in there was <laughs> spot on. And so that yeah. tells you uh, how useful it was for her, obviously very useful. Let's jump into the main event here, which is a discussion of what the ABA has been up to in the last week. Hmm. And uh, it got to the point where the other night LSAT was trending on Twitter nationally. It was in the top 20 uh, searches, which I found to be kind of hilarious. I was like, ah, oh, the LSAT's having a little moment. But it was because of something that the ABA has done. So let's dive into what's occurring because... This is something that uh, could conceivably start to affect people, you know, maybe as soon as this fall, but certainly anybody applying next year is uh, possibly going to face this. So let's kind of like do an overview of the situation, what the consequences are. And I'll just start off by talking about what happened. Yeah. And on April 25th, the ABA actually made a decision and wrote a memorandum. And it wasn't the entire ABA. It was the Strategic Review Committee. So a little subcommittee that was focused on talking about a very uh, small section of the rules. And they wrote a memo that finally was posted online late last week. And then at that point, it was noticed by others. And then it became something of a hot topic. And what they did was they made a recommendation that the ABA, as part of their general standards, eliminate the requirement, and that's an important word there, the requirement that a standardized test be used when considering uh, law school applicants for admission. So specifically, you have these ABA standards and rules of procedure for the approval of law schools. And these are the guidelines that basically tell law schools, this is how you need to operate. Uh, it talks about information disclosure. So when you hear people talk about ABA 509 required disclosures of information, that's inside these rules of procedure. Well, there are two that are really relevant for law school applicants and specifically people who are interested in the LSAT, and that is standards 501 and 503. Standard 501 is about admissions, and it basically tells law schools, you need to admit sound applicants who can ultimately pass the bar. 
And then standard 503 is called admissions test. And it says you must, you are required to use a valid test to help admit students. For years, that was the LSAT. It basically said the LSAT. And then they opened it up and said, all right, you just have to find something valid. And that's where the GRE started to chisel in and weasel their way to saying, hey, you guys can use us as well. And this is really odd to me because so recently they said the GRE can be used as a full-fledged test. And now what they're coming in and they're saying, we might want to change that. So, John, what does the recommendation in the memorandum itself say? Yeah, I was just flashing back to the fact that it seems like only three or four episodes ago, we were talking about the GRE's newfound prominence in this from the ABA. And we've seen the ABA change policy before and watch the ripple effect that has. The, the one that occurs to me first is uh, the averaging of scores versus the reporting of only the highest, mm -hmm. which completely, in many ways, like reconfigured how law schools would treat applicants with multiple scores. You were no longer this composite mean you just became your best day. And that was due to the change in ABA policy. So we know that these changes in policies can be significant. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and a huge effect. Yeah. So let me, let me quote from this because I think, as with anything in this particular field, the devil's in the details. So here's the new language proposed, emphasis on proposed, for that 503 admissions test clause. It says this, in quotes, a law school may use admissions tests as part of sound admission practices and policies. The law school shall identify in its admission policies any tests it accepts. And I, I tried to put some inflection there on the key idea, which is that they've gone from must to may. Yeah. It used to say required there, right. must, that idea. Now it says may. And here's, here's the thing, though. This is a recommendation. It's a proposal. And so what happened was, is especially in some news uh, avenues, you saw them say, well, that's it for the LSAT. We're not at that point yet. And we'll come back to the May versus required part uh, a little bit later and talk about it because it's not saying you cannot use the LSAT. It's just saying you don't necessarily have to. And that opens the door a little bit, but we don't think that the effects are going to be as great maybe as some would have hoped and others wouldn't have hoped. But the key thing is, is this is just a proposal at this point. It's actually a memorandum that has been sent along. So it's not final at this point. Nothing has been changed. Yeah. The policies are exactly the same today as they were a week ago. This all has to be approved through a series of steps, and then something might happen. So the real key thing is, what happens next? What happens next? Yeah, a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction here, they read this almost like an obituary. Well, like the death knell of, of today's the LSAT's primacy. And the fact of the matter is they're still in discussions. So glad you asked. What happens next, Dave? Yeah, so let's talk about what, what occurs, and then we'll talk about the outcomes, if it's accepted, you know, approved, denied, whatever happens there, and we'll see what kind of like outcomes actually exist. So the first thing is, is right now there's a comment period. Uh, the ABA has posted the memo on their website. Now they ask for comment and review, and various interested parties will come in and say, this is what our thoughts are on it. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a court saying, all right, we want uh, you know friends of the court to make a comment about something they think could be an important policy uh, decision that's about to be made. When we saw this type of thing before, you ended up seeing a variety of groups. Um, ETS and LSAC both commented. Uh, back when the GRE was up for debate, some law schools commented. Mm -hmm. um, there were some various diversity groups that commented about the effects of tests and so forth and, and the LSAT versus the GRE. Uh, there were some individuals who commented, you, you know, kind of oddly enough, you know, there's Billy making a comment about you need to, you know, keep the LSAT and not have the GRE. Now that debate will change and it'll be more about, do we need an actual test? Mm -hmm. And so we should see a number of groups weigh in uh, about that. Once that comment period closes, that is kind of like, kind of like food for thought. What will happen then is that the memo was sent to the council of the section of legal education and admissions to the bar, which is a huge mouthful. Yeah. And everybody doesn't use that title for it. They just call it the council. Really ominously. That is ominous, what? isn't it? Yeah. So right now it's been posted to the council. The council is going to take this issue up later on in the month of May. 
and they'll have the opportunity to look at all those comments uh, beforehand, and then they will actually discuss it and vote on it. And if you follow me on Twitter, I will assuredly be live tweeting that when it happens and tweet the outcome as well. So the big question is, who's on the council? Yeah. Who's this fall to to make decisions now? Yeah. Who are, who are the people that are making this decision? Well, there's 21 of them. So the first thing is big, mm-hmm. <laughs> which also means you got a lot of people, you'll have a lot of different views, but they're lawyers, they're professors, they're administrators, you know, they're all sorts of different individuals. So the, the big question that everyone has been asking is, what do you think the council will do? Yeah. And the information that I have suggests very strongly that the council will indeed approve this recommendation to change the language from required to may. Mm-hmm. So here you've got the council. They're like, yes, do it. Put this, put this into the rules. What happens then? <laughs> well, frankly, what I think may well happen, and this is probabilistic as opposed to certain, but I think there's probably going to be another one of these almost like focus group comment periods that they open back up. So we suggested this. Let's hear from the people. All right. We've now kind of codified it. Let's hear again from the people. Yeah, and they would do that because the council, uh, we'll see how weirdly convoluted this is, which may be unsurprising in certain respects. I think we're only halfway through the process and it already feels like I'm in a yeah. labyrinth. It goes to the council. The council approves it. Is it a done deal at that point? No, no. No. It's not. That's actually just stage one. At that point, they refer it to the House of Delegates, so a much bigger group for actual review. And it is likely that they'll open it up for comments again. It's not necessary, though. If they get enough comments or they feel like there's, you know, they're comprehensive enough, and given that there's only a few weeks here, they may not, they'll probably do another comment period. And then later on, this is kind of like late summer, early fall, I think it's like September, there's an ABA House of Delegates meeting. Then they get to vote on the proposed change. Mm -hmm. So the real question then is, is, all right, so now the council makes their decision. You're like, oh, wait, someone else has to then? It's just, it's moving up the tiers here. What do we think that the full House of Delegates will then do? Again, my suspicion here, because this is a slightly different group of people than just the council, which sounds like a bunch of Bond villains. I think the House of Delegates is probably going to deny it. I don't think they're in favor of doing this. Yeah, a lot of these people are lawyers, and I can tell you that online, the reaction to this was uh, decidedly negative. Mm -hmm. So There wasn't a lot, there were certainly people out there who were like, good, get rid of it, it's stupid, it's a waste of time. Uh, There were certainly more people that were like, no, you need standards, the LSAT helps law schools make determination about who can pass the bar. And without, you know, passing judgment on the value of the LSAT, that's what people were saying, and a lot of them were attorneys. They were they were really of the mindset that, no, you need something to help make these determinations. Whether or not they're right or not doesn't matter. That's what they were saying. And we think a lot of the people in the House of Delegates are actually going to have that same view. And there's also that bit of like, I did it, so you have to do it yeah. kind of mindset. Yeah, it's okay. not quite misery loves company, but there's a flavor of that in there. Yeah. I saw a lot of attorneys who were like, look, I had to deal with it. I thought it was a, you know, a useful test. I think everyone else should. Kind of like, I suffered, you suffer. Most people that intimately connected with just the law school experience, too, I think have learned, sometimes in hindsight, the appropriate degree to which you should value this test. And that degree is pretty high for most of these people, and certainly for most schools thus far. This test wouldn't have existed the way it has with the prominence it has if it didn't serve useful functions. So I think you're going to find a lot of people with that background who are very reluctant to say that we can do away with this thing that presumably they found to be useful. Yeah, there were issues years ago when they tried to add the GRE. They objected to adding the GRE initially when we went through this process three, four years ago. Now they've finally done that just this fall, as we said. And here we are now talking about, let's just get rid of them entirely. It, It really feels like we don't know what we're doing. Uh, It feels like a game that people are playing with each other. But I do happen to agree with you, John. I think that the House of Delegates membership will go ahead and deny that change. So the question is, is it dead at that point? Well, we know if they pass it. Let's say the House of Delegates comes in and they're like, fair enough, change the language. Um, It's no longer mandatory. Well, then it's approved. And then it gets implemented as kind of the law for law schools next year. 
Yeah. If they deny it, though, and this is what's crazy, this thing just refuses to die. It's not dead. It then goes back to the council again. The, the very people who originally approved it actually hold the ultimate power yeah. at the end of this all to override the House of Delegates and approve it. <laughs> So I'm kind of like, why send it to the House of Delegates anyway, guys, if you know you have the power and you want to exercise it? Yeah, we need to hear him say yes twice is basically what it sounds like. Yeah, I think, you know, they kind of like previewed this idea. They said that last time we had some of these debates, there was organized and like comprehensive opposition. I think they want to take the temperature. If it's mm -hmm. kind of lukewarm in the middle and it doesn't pass, but it's not, uh, you know, all that controversial, they'll overturn it without thinking. If it's really strident and they start to see, hey, the vote's way out of line, maybe they'll change their mind. But if it does go back to the council, I think you and I are of the opinion that the chances are pretty good that they'll override the House of Delegates vote and approve this. So almost no matter what route it takes, it seems like the chances of this being approved and then turned into kind of like the, the law or the rules for this, the standard as it were, is pretty likely to occur. Yeah, my personal take on it is I think if the council pushes it through the first time to the House of Delegates, unless there is some sort of just violently fierce opposition from the House of Delegates, then when it gets kicked back to the council for round two, they will approve it. It seems to me that's definitely the direction they're leaning in. I don't know what it would take to sway them, but I imagine it would be something pretty, you know, frothy. Yeah. And if there's storm and fury about this right. at the House of Delegates, then I could see a problem. Uh, the immediate word that I had um, from one of my colleagues was, this looks like they're going to overturn it and the council feels very strongly about it. And then I've had that confirmed two separate times since then uh, by other people who kind of like have knowledge of the inside workings of the council. And so I would say, yeah, we're probably looking at this getting approved at some point. That's what it seems which like. Which is pretty wild. Well, yeah, equally wild is I really like when our crystal balls are about the test. This is not the kind of predictions that I love to do. Um, <laughs> because again, it's so circuitous and too many wild card factors here. But it does seem, I, I won't say it's a foregone conclusion, but I think smart money is that this does get approved uh, in, eventually, you know. Yeah, it's like operating the Congress. You know, there's a cub committee, then there's a subcommittee, then you have to send it from the House to the Senate. It's just like, okay, whatever. Just, you know, find the people who have the power, make the decision, give us you know, a final vote. Yeah. I keep having flashbacks. Most like, you remember that cartoon where, like, this is how a bill becomes a law, and it's that little document <laughs> that dances up the steps of the Capitol. I'm just a bill. That guy, yeah. That's what I'm having <laughs> flashback to. It's like, oh my God, they make this difficult. <laughs> I'm a law now. <laughs> Oh man, those things were kind great. Of the schoolhouse, school, yeah. uh, schoolhouse, schoolhouse rock, rock, I think is mm -hmm. what they call it. It's our song for now, next week. What do I think is going to happen in the short term? Probably nothing. Even if they approve this in September, and I think law schools would have the ability to go ahead and relax it immediately. A lot of their materials printed, a lot of the policies are in place. They're really ready. I don't know that they would immediately change anything, but they would then have full power the following year to make changes. So it's hard to see at the end of this year what actually happens. I don't think anything. Um, maybe a school or two might say, well, I really don't need to keep the LSAT, so I'm going to let this student in or that student in. But I think it's the following year where we begin to see broader effects there. Yeah, I agree with you on that. I, whatever happens here, I, I don't think we're going to see anything terribly immediate in terms of consequence. <laughs> Yeah, so let's talk about this because what happens is it's not as if they just say you don't need the LSAT anymore. What they say instead here is it's now in the hands of individual schools. And each individual school has their own choice how to handle this. So the real question is, once the ABA makes their decision, let's just say they approve it for discussion purposes, mm -hmm. what do you think the schools will do when they are given that choice? Well, the first thing I can say with absolute certainty is at no point are schools going to stop accepting LSAT results. They're never going to not want to hear them if you have a score on record or if you're planning to take the test. I think their preference is always going to be give us data, give us credentials. Um, so if you're thinking like, oh boy, schools are anti-LSAT, that is not the way this is going to go. That's the first thing. Even if they're not required to take LSAT scores, I think they'd still prefer them in most cases. But I also think, Dave, we're going to see a really interesting split of schools depending on where they are, where they live in terms of the overall, whether it's rankings or just prestige and, you know, 
longevity factor of, of who these schools are known to be. I think you're going to see a lot of different reactions along that spectrum. Yeah. And some of them are going to be more militant than others mm -hmm. ab about this, but they will probably to a school all accept it. So if you had a great LSAT score, they will say, we will go ahead and look at it. We'll actually talk a, a little bit more about this point and the latitude they have, because this has happened in other fields and that's instructive here. And, and as we will see, uh, when it's happened elsewhere, they kept on using tests. Yeah. So I think that'll probably happen here. So when we look at these individual schools, I don't think it's a random walk of results in terms of what the schools actually do. So let's start with the schools at the top. Mm -hmm. Here we have these schools that are, say, uh, top 20, uh, T25, maybe even T30. What do you think that they do with kind of like the use of the LSAT? Well, the first thing we can say, if they've made it up into that um, range of prestige, is that the LSAT's clearly serving them well. It's been a factor in their success. It's been a factor in, again, the credentials that they're able to express about themselves to be considered so highly. The last thing they want to do is, you know, upturn the apple cart on, to mix my metaphors, uh, kind of a golden goose. <laughs> it's a really mixed. <laughs> I didn't see good. goose coming. I, I don't know what to say. But <laughs> the LSAT has been good for these places. Look, if you're Chicago, you're basking in the glow of, what, number three now. You're loving the LSAT these days. Yale's always going to want your LSAT scores. Harvard, New York. I mean, these are these are places where the LSAT, it hasn't just been some longstanding tradition. It has actually served them well in terms of how they're able to evaluate candidates. Um, and clearly, it's it's working. Well, it's helped cement their position at the top mm -hmm. and keep other schools out. Now, I do think that what you'll see, especially with the schools at the top, Yale and Harvard uh, in particular, is they will say it's not required. Mm -hmm. I believe that they'll actually give lip service to that idea. And you can see that these schools have added the GRE. Harvard was a very early adopter of the GRE overall. Uh, and I think that is a very good public forward, public facing stance where they're like, look, we're very open minded about this. However, I think internally, the chances are that they'd really prefer to see the LSAT uh, being used. It gives them another data point. And I have heard from multiple deans that for a lot of applicants, they look at people who take the LSAT as being more serious. You're willing to put in the effort. We know that it's hard work. We know it's a tough test. We want to see your results on this. And that was compared to the GRE. Mm -hmm. Now, LSAT versus no test, people who are taking the LSAT are going to stand out as being like more committed. So I think that even if they say, if Yale were to come out and say, you don't have to have a, a test score, it is optional, and they may admit a few people without test scores, yeah. by and large, they'll still adhere to the use of the test and move forward from there because it has served them extremely well, as you say. Yeah, there's going to be some fantastically just well-qualified applicants without maybe the LSAT credentials that they're still going to want to let in. This does at least allow them to do that. I think that'll be the case in some fringe moments, but that's going to be the exception, not the rule. I think the top-ranked schools are still going to be very LSAT-centric. Yeah, and perhaps uh, surprisingly, I think the schools at the very bottom will also continue to use the LSAT. If you look at the U.S. News and World Rankings, when they get down to the bottom quartile, the bottom fourth of schools, they don't really rank them. They just put them in there at like 147 to 192 and kind of lump them all together. But one of the things the LSAT has been proven to be able to predict over time is that there's kind of like a minimum cutoff where once you start dropping below a certain LSAT score, your chances of passing the bar drop rapidly as well. And this is why schools are like, look, if you've got, say, a 135 or 136 or 137, uh, we are very concerned about your ability to go through school and then to pass the test. Sometimes people say, well, uh, those two things are completely unrelated. The LSAT's not the bar. No, I agree. I, I, I do agree. They don't test the same things at all. However, they are tests mm -hmm. and they're just different types of tests. And if you're struggling on this type of test for a lot of law schools, they think, hey, we are supposed to admit sound applicants. And if you are going to have a low LSAT score, we're thinking that you might not be good enough to get through law school and to be able to pass the bar. And that's one of the things the LSAT helps us do. If you're in the lower portion of the rankings, one of your challenges is, is that bar passage rate makes a difference, not only for US News and World Report, but very importantly for the ABA. Mm -hmm. When schools go on probation with the ABA, a lot of times bar passage is at the centerpiece of it. 
So if you're down in that bottom quartile, instead of you thinking, oh, this is, you know, this is free reign, we can do what we want. You're probably going to say, no, we really need to make sure that the people we're admitting can pass the bar later on because that is so central to our mission. You're probably unlikely to actually walk away from using the LSAT. Yeah, if anything, I mean, a lot of people to me have always misconstrued the LSAT as being a measure of who you are as an applicant. While that's certainly true, it's only half the picture. It is to schools in many ways also representative of who they can expect you to be. And that's the thing they care the most about. They don't want to admit a lot of people who can't become practicing lawyers. So they use this test, especially in, in, like you say, the kind of the bottom quartile there. They're going to use this as a way to still uh, maybe reinforce or reconfirm their own suspicions about what it is you can and can't do. That's exactly right. So what we have here is the situation probably is at the top and the bottom. Everybody's like, yeah, we still want the LSAT. We strongly prefer is, is probably right, the language that we'll begin to see in applications, which is code words for give us a test result. <laughs> uh, that, now, does that mean the schools in the middle do the same thing? No, actually, I think they're the ones who would have a, the greatest degree of latitude here. And that's because they're dealing with students who they can see their GPAs are pretty solid. And maybe they're thinking to themselves, well, we can tell enough about this person where there's, they're not, they don't have academic performance questions hanging over them. And so ultimately, I think we might see that range that's like, I don't know, 60 to 75, uh, down to say like 110, 125, where some of the schools admit more students without test scores than the schools ranked above or below them. Yeah, I think that's thoughts? exactly the case. This is a group of schools that I think by and large would give themselves more latitude to take more applicants, especially if we continue to see applicant numbers dropping. To them, this is I mean, this is a gold mine potentially. And I think they also trust their own institutional curriculum to maybe get people who would have struggled with the LSAT ready enough for the bar that they still believe passage is likely. That's exactly right. And there's obviously a, a number of possible choices that a school can make there. But this does give them that kind of like backdoor opportunity to say, all right, you don't have a test, but you've got a 3-9 and you've got, you know, all these glowing recommendations. Uh, and maybe you're a student who's like, look, I'm this test is killing me. You go to a, an, an administrator, just the mere kind of admission that this test is killing me is going to give them pause. Mm -hmm. So just be aware of that if you're kind of like contemplating this down the line. That's going to make them a little bit worried, but they might say, look, not everybody's great at tests. But again, at the end of this road, there is the bar, a demonstrably harder test than the LSAT because it's so comprehensive and requires so much knowledge. So they're, the idea that, hey, I'm just bad at tests, this isn't going to be kind of like the get out of jail free card that people think. Yeah. I'll tell you where some of my worry still lingers here is that a lot of people are going to hear this, or at least some fraction. They're going to hear this and immediately start to think to themselves, well, what's the best school I can get into without ever having to even think about the LSAT? And I think if you come at it with that type of attitude or that approach, you are not only immediately self-limiting what your options can be, because for a lot of schools, that's just not going to fly. But I think you also do yourself a disservice in terms of what this test can be for you. And we'll talk a little more, maybe in a bit, about what the LSAT represents. It's not just a reflection of you. It's an opportunity to show a better version. Of yourself. Yeah, there's a second group of people that worries me as well, mm -hmm. aside from the ones that you just talked about. And that would be the group of people who say, oh, if a test is no longer required, it's not as important. Right. Therefore, my performance on this test, I'm still going to take it, but it doesn't matter if I get a 156 or a 159. Those three points are irrelevant. Or if I get a 164 or 168, that doesn't make a difference because the test is less important. That is not the case. You're still going to be the score, the highest score you have on record. And when they have that in their hands, they are going to assess you compared to other students. And those differences will actually play out in terms of the admissions results that you see. So yeah. the downplaying of the kind of like, well, it's not required, therefore it's not important. That is not how this will work. Yeah, that's a really great point, actually. I hadn't thought it fully out, but now that I do think about it a bit more, I fear that. I fear that a lot of people are going to think this means that – the old adages about you know reaching your full potential or submitting the best you can has now been replaced by good enough. And again, I don't think that's what this signals. It's not what it signals and it's not how it's going to be. I can more or less guarantee that. But I have a feeling in future years, John, assuming this is approved, 
you and I will end up having that conversation a lot about, Mm -hmm. you know, talking to people about, yeah, it says that's strongly recommended, but if you're going to take this test, you better go all out for it. So there's, you know, there's other things that can happen here too. You know, one of the things that we already see being floated around is that schools or even LSAC can create alternative pathways, Mm -hmm. get around like this test, um, and even create new measures. Uh, There is the legal kind of pathway that LSAC recently threw out there. And they're talking about doing something that is like almost like a standardized pre-law curriculum. University of Arizona has proposed JD Next, which is very similar to that as well. Both those programs have talked about having an admissions exam on the end of things, which is just another version of the LSAT or the GRE. It's just a different test. So I personally don't see the value of it, but these things do exist. Like there's a lot of balls in the air right now around this. And I think both those programs play well with test optional because it says, hey, there might be a different way to measure students. I'm sure that you and I will be doing uh, a podcast at some point about JD Next and the legal uh, education pathway that LSAC has proposed uh, probably sometime this fall. Yeah, I let's hope it's just a podcast. Last thing I want to do is sit down and write another book. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. So let's talk about a few other considerations because, you know, if we've talked about like what it means and what the schools are actually going to do, that is a really large piece in this process, but that isn't everything. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of those considerations that are worth looking at. And the first one is one that I've already mentioned. Yeah, I was going to say, if you don't mind, I was going to bring this up too. I think I know where you're going, which is the the nature of how ad comms treat the LSAT versus other tests. The, I think the word you used before was that it's a more serious test and thus typically a more serious applicant who's taken it. I saw this with the GRE Mm -hmm. when the GRE started to come into the discussion, a number of admissions deans said, well, we've used the LSAT for years. It's the test for law school. When you take the GRE, it looks to us like you're just looking for any grad school. Yeah. And by the way, I still think this is true. So you might be wanting to become a history professor, or maybe you want to go to law school instead, or maybe you want to take that GRE and go to business school. But when you take the LSAT, the only thing the LSAT's used for is law school. And I know right then and there, you're a law student. Yeah. The GRE doesn't signal that to me. Let me ask a question to clarify, because you said, I still think this is true. And I'm wondering, do you think it's true that they still feel this way when they look at applicants? Or do you think it's true what they're actually saying? I think it's the former, but I just want to make sure. <laughs> yeah, it's. I still think they feel that way. Okay, I do too. The GRE, in you know, in five years, this this will probably and be different. But right now, law schools are like the LSAT's only used for one thing. So when you take that, you're signaling your intent. GRE is still used for everything, so that doesn't look like the same level of seriousness. Now you remove even another barrier there, and you say, well, you didn't take a test at all. Mm-hmm. You could easily be a candidate who's like, I just want to do it on a lark, see if I get in. Whereas someone who went out and took the LSAT and spent all that time, again, you look more serious. Those types of biases and ingrained views don't disappear overnight. And they don't disappear just because the ABA said, we're going to change this language in this standard. A lot of these people have been, do- have been doing this for you know, 10, 15, 20 plus years, and this is how they think. And they're going to go on thinking that. And that's one of the, the big things here is, is that you, you can see these changes happening, but the legal canon, the architecture of it changes very slowly. And I hear that all the time in my conversations with, with kind of like legal experts. Yeah. As I had to explain to a student the other day, I was like, regardless of what happens here, the LSAT's never just going to be some attractive extracurricular. These people are too well entrenched in valuing it as the most important element or aspect of an applicant. Even if they don't have to do that anymore, it's awfully hard to shake those preconceptions, especially if they've been successful for you, like the schools we talked about. Well, I mean, we've talked in, in past episodes about multiplier formulas that have been used by law schools that you know became public knowledge. And those multipliers often weighed the LSAT four to five times mm-hmm. as heavily as GPA. So now you have this piece that is massively important. And you and I have said for years, the LSAT is the number one indicator of the type of law school that you will get into. It's that important. And it's because it's the only universal standard. So something that important doesn't just disappear overnight. Right. 
And of course, that's one of the big concerns here is, is that, and this is what a lot of lawyers were saying online, they're like, it's the only universal comparison point. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know about the grades at Stanford versus Georgia Tech. I don't know which one is looser, which one is tighter. Actually, I do, as do you. Yeah. Uh, we know that Stanford has you know, a reputation for great inflation, and Georgia Tech has exactly the opposite reputation of, of instead having a very tight curve. How do I compare students from those two schools? Their GPAs don't mean the same thing. Class rank maybe helps out, but that's still relative to the population in the school. Mm -hmm. LSAT doesn't have those problems. It's a national unified measure that puts everybody on roughly the same scaling and says, what's your final outcome? Yes, yeah, the great that's, equalizer. Yeah, it's valuable to law schools and can be very valuable to applicants, as we'll talk about momentarily. Mm -hmm. But that type of thing, that's a concern that goes away. But that's why the test is so important to law schools in the first place. And look, this isn't without precedent in related fields. We've seen other schools that have been essentially given the option of making tests optional for their applicants. You don't have to insist that someone has taken, say, the GMAT to now go to graduate school or business school or even the MCAT for certain medical um, pursuits. Mm -hmm. And what have schools done? By and large, they have kept those types of, and again, I'm doing air quotes around requirements, expectations in place. They'd still prefer it. The last thing you want to do is try to get to the best school possible by denying them what they prefer. Yeah. And by the way, the LSAT is, there are exemptions to it. Sure. For example, there are undergraduate exemptions if you go to the same law school, kind of like Michigan undergrad to Michigan law school, there's a pathway where you can avoid the LSAT. Mm -hmm. we, we see this in the MCAT field. You and I don't deal with medical school really at all. But I know that there are special like early access programs mm -hmm. where you don't have to have an MCAT score. Um, there's a variety of things like that, kind of joint degrees where you can get away with not having it. But that's because the curriculum starts a lot earlier. But they are okay with skipping the test. Uh, and you see some of this kind of optionality in grad schools, in business school, as you mentioned. And what has happened is, is that they still use the test results. Mm -hmm. Even in biz school, when the GRE became kind of uh, available, it still defaulted that at first they were like, well, we prefer the GMAT. And they're like, we don't prefer either one, but we do like one of them. We just want a test result there. And I think that's ultimately what we're going to see on the law school side if all of this goes through. Yeah, I think so too. There's another huge component here, and it seems a little crazy that it would have what I think could be the type of impact that it will. And that's the rankings themselves, specifically U.S. News and World Report rankings. They get published each year. We know roughly, and we've actually covered it in a recent episode, how their algorithm breaks down in terms of the weighting of various criteria and things, uh, the metrics that they use to rank schools. LSAT has always been a huge piece of that. What are they going to do now? And I ask that slightly rhetorically because I'm not sure either of us actually knows. No, they've got their options. and it's. I mean, I'll be honest, it's stupid that we would talk about essentially a newspaper and their opinions of law schools having an effect on, on whether or not a policy or a test would be used or not used. But rankings run the law school world. This is just a fact. It's not, I would change it if I could, but I have no power on this. And if U.S. News comes out and says, we strongly prefer that you have test results, you can bet that law schools will do the same thing to their applicants. And we've seen them do this in other areas. Mm -hmm. uh, in business school, they've kind of said, we really would like to see results. Uh, and think about it. If you're US News, what would you prefer? Another kind of like clear cut data point? Or would you rather have that removed? Yeah. Of course you want to have that extra data point. You get something you can put in black and white and say, yes, Yale is better than this other school because Yale has a higher LSAT score. It justifies your viewpoint. Actually, becomes self reinforcing, but that's a whole other point. <laughs> it does. The other thing that's self reinforcing, frankly, is I don't think they want to have to go back to the drawing board and now try to figure out how to rank schools lacking what has been often like the central uh, unifying objective measure. So, yeah, it's not, it's not the biggest part of their rankings. There's things like reputation and so forth sure. that, yeah, that are bigger. That <laughs> but it's a piece. Yeah, we have talked about that. We've criticized that <laughs> severely. It's a piece. And here's the other thing. Is U.S. News likely to move quickly on this? Are they likely to say to themselves, okay, you don't need a test result? No, not no. at first. Because if later on they decide they needed to change their mind, it would be very hard to come back in four or five years and be like, hey, we want everyone to take the LSAT now. Schools would say, 
no, we've been doing it this way. We're the schools. However, if they keep it as it is and say, we'd really prefer a test result, right now the schools will say, yeah, that's fine. We would too. And it looks like everything's kind of like concomitantly working. Mm-hmm. Everybody's on the same page. So I think even U.S. News is likely to say there's going to be a preference for test score results because it helps them and it keeps kind of the status quo. They'll always make little minor changes to their rankings in order to sell more copies of the subscription. But for now, I think their preference is going to be keep test results when at all possible and maybe give a slight benefit to those schools, which means that schools will see that and flock to that kind of view. Yeah, yeah. There's another reason I think it's going to be quite a lag before we see anything too seismic from this, which is that we're talking about factors at the very beginning of the law school journey. And they're often not really seen in terms of like the reciprocal until the very end of it. When someone goes and tries to get a job or take the bar and pass and fail, if schools start letting in a bunch of non-LSAT applicants, it's three years before we know what the bar effect from those people is going to be. I can't imagine, say US News, is overly eager to start putting, you know, their claims on things when really what they should do is say, we're going to give this at least a few years till we can measure the bar outcomes. Yeah, which is, by the way, one of the best arguments for why there won't be a massive sea change. Exactly. You're, you're not going to go from like uh, 100% of the people having a test result to only like 20 or 30% having a test result in, the, in a year or two because they don't know what the effect will be on the bar. Instead, they'll slowly let those people in and then see how they perform. If they perform well, then maybe they'll let more in. If they don't, they'll stop doing it. Schools track this longitudinally. They look at it over the years and they say what works and what doesn't. Mm-hmm. And it's really, really crazy. I've you know, heard stories of people saying, I got into a school and I was talking to the dean and they're like, hey, you went to this particular school, right? Wow, we never admit people from there. We had some bad experiences. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we really kind of, you know, we're very careful with applicants from that school. That's a known thing that happens out there. So they're not going to make a huge change here. Yeah. And I'll, so. and I'll say that there's actually, from a student perspective, some things to really think about when you consider whether or not this is a good thing or not. And again, I'm not passing judgment on what's right or what's wrong. I'm just saying these are things to think about. And really, there's two major points. The first one is, is that for a lot of students, the LSAT is really like this kind of last chance, this saving grace, this moonshot, where if you haven't had the greatest academic record, you can all of a sudden put yourself in position to get into really good schools by nailing the LSAT. It's the thing that is kind of like pulls you up. Not, not for everybody. And we've seen a number of high GPA people who struggle with the LSAT who hate it. And they have a different story on this. But there's a number of people who are sitting there thinking, I don't want to lose this chance to reverse my fortunes. Maybe I partied too much in college. And if you did, I understand who you are. Oh, I thought that, that was confessional, but okay. <laughs> it is a little <laughs> confessional. Was- it's also sympathetic and empathetic uh, <laughs> as well. You know, if your GPA could have been better, I still wouldn't trade my college experience for a higher GPA. My no. GPA was good enough. Um, but if you're applying to Yale, uh, I'm sure Yale would be like, your GPA wasn't good enough. But maybe the LSAT comes in and you're like, you score out in the 170s and the school who you'd like to go to says, we would really like to have you come as well. And it's your LSAT score that got you in. There's tons of stories like that. And those people came out, by the way, online the other night when this was being talked about. They're like, I wouldn't have gotten into schools like Texas or what have you mm-hmm. without my LSAT score. So I think this is a terrible idea. This is a great leveler. So that's one thing. The other thing is this, is that uh, for a number of students, that higher LSAT score translated into more money. Yeah. So you take this away and all of a sudden there's a group of people that you will lose, people who struggled academically or didn't take college seriously. Or and you'll also lose people who won't get as much money in their financial aid offer as they would otherwise. That, you think, well, who do I add? You're also going to lose people as well. And this is, I think, especially for you and I, John, very cogent because the LSAT's not just a test that we look at and say, well, there it is. We know you can beat this test. Oh, for sure. Yeah. There's no more expedient way to distinguish yourself, um, both in terms of admissions and money, than the LSAT. And with the right strategies, which I'm happy to report we have, you can beat this test. It's learnable, it's coachable, it's beatable. And we see people do it every day. So, my take on it to this point is obviously we can't predict what's going to happen 
But as long as schools are willing to use your LSAT results in your favor, then you have a real opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to be well prepared and give yourself that asset. Yeah, think about something like Logic Games. I can't tell you the number of students I've had who've walked in who can only get like four or five right in the Logic Games section, and they walk out getting 19 or 20 right, or even all the questions right. All of a sudden, the number of schools they could have gotten into has completely changed, and the type of school has completely changed, and then also the financial aid offers they're getting at the end, utterly different. That's a huge type of kind of like differential in what might be two or three months of time. Yeah, it's a short-term fix for what might be a long-term GPA problem or some kind of, you know, uh, misdemeanor concerns, behavioral kind of issues that you might have had in the past. Taking that away, I think, would hurt a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, to me, just the central premise of it is changing a little bit, but not in any way that should change the behavior. It's no longer, do I have to have this kind of score to go? But God, wouldn't I like to have that kind of score? And what benefits could it still give me? That hasn't yeah. changed at all, no matter what decisions come down through the council or the syndicate or whatever villainous thing they've called themselves. The council. And if you think about it, law schools are aware of how important this is in terms of changing people's outcomes because splitters have success mm -hmm. in law school applications. You can come in with a not great GPA and a really high LSAT score and get into schools that, you know, the numbers would say, hey, maybe you shouldn't just off the, you know, off the shelf there. But that's because schools are saying we're matching things up. They know what they would lose with this. And that's one reason why this won't change very quickly. This is at really at worst going to be a very slow process. In five years, I still don't think the change will be very massive. Uh, it'll be more than it is, you know, this year or next, but it'll be very small overall. It'll, it'll eventually end up at a stasis where these standardized tests are still very central to the whole process. Yeah. And the reward basis on which they exist is still central too. Uh, and I'd hate but, for people to lose sight of that. We've talked a little bit about, you know, what the ABA is up to. We've talked about the schools and the possible decisions, and we've even talked about factors around that and, and kind of what would affect the decision and how it might affect students. There's one group we haven't talked about, John, which I'm always interested in talking about, and that is our friends at LSAC. Yeah, save the best for last. These are the poor saps who make the LSAT, <laughs> and now they're being told, we don't necessarily need you anymore, friends. After 70 plus years of saying, hey, this is, this is our test. You, you were made for us. I mean, they were soulmates. Yeah. And it's been a long marriage. And now one of the partners in the marriage is like, can we open this thing up? That was the first of the GRE. And now it's like, maybe I just want a divorce. Yeah. Who gets divorced <laughs> in their 80s? That's what this feels like. <laughs> Uh, it is kind of feeling that way. But if you're LSAC, you're probably feeling jilted right now. Here we were, you know, this was our partner, and then they wanted to open our marriage up. That bothered them. They got very angry about that, and they yelled. And now their partner's like, I think we should just maybe go our separate ways or at least not be as connected at the hip as we used to be. Yeah. If we're using so, marriage analogies, this has become an open relationship, I think. <laughs> Yeah, well, that was the GRE, was the open relationship. Oh, what is this now? N Just Now we're talking divorce. Okay. I don't need you anymore. I want to go do my own thing. I want to consider other people. That's what that's what we have. I'm going to run with this marriage analogy like with, I think with LSAC. <laughs> but they have so not, they've, they've not been entirely silent so far as no. you would expect. They've come and out. And they won't be messaging. silent. Yeah. So what are they thinking? What are they going to do here? Well, I can summarize some of it. The most comprehensive, if you're really curious, they have put a, a new page on their site and updated it with some more commentary. Uh, we can link it here in this podcast or you can search it out. But in summation, some of the things they've said, essentially the, the same narrative they've preached when the GRE began to make encroachments or when there were even just whispers of this a couple of years ago. Um, and I think a lot of what they say holds true, even if it is self-serving. For instance, they say... Uh, that it's the single most accurate predictor of law school success. LSAT scores are the best measure in a predictive sense as to how you are going to perform in school. And as we know, they're a great measure of how you're likely to perform on the bar after school. They are still LSAC with their test here, the only standardized assessment that is accepted by all uh, American Bar Association affiliated or approved schools. That's true. Um, GRE is getting there, but for now they can hold the title. And here to me is maybe what the most important one is, and this is something we've touched on 
It was both schools and applicants. So the place you want to go and the people listening to this, they know what LSAT scores mean. This is a familiar metric and measure. And so it's going to continue to inform the process because there simply isn't anything better to step in and do that. People just are comfortable with what they know, and that is the LSAT. Yeah, so right now they'll sit and wait like Mm -hmm. everybody else. They'll make their comment um, to the ABA. Um, From our purposes, you and I are fans of the LSAT. It's a test that we find endlessly interesting and entertaining. I hope they do a good job of it. I hope they don't fall back on things like we're the gold standard because it's not 1896 anymore. Williams Jennings Bryan isn't actually making his cross of gold speech. So we don't need to have this kind of thing. Nice reference. Oh, yeah. Classic history right here. <laughs> and uh, I think you know how much I hate the, the phrase gold standard. Yes, I do. So it's not something that uh, they need to be focused on the past. They need to talk about what the LSAT has done that's beneficial. Uh, and I've heard them talk a little bit about this. One of the things they talked about was the, you know, the negative effect on diversity that you'd see in law schools if the LSAT was removed. And I was like, well, why don't you guys publish this? Why don't you get this out there and talk a little bit more about it? So we'll see what kind of data they pull out because obviously they have all the information about LSAT scores, admissions to law schools, and the ultimate outcomes with, you know, graduating law school, as well as taking the bar. And if I was them, I would be sitting there uh, working furiously to put together the most convincing uh, kind of like example of how this all works and really kind of look to convince the schools that this isn't just something that will be a negative if you take it away. It'll really cause issues and it'll hurt all your member schools. But that's their job, not mine. So they've heard my advice, hopefully. Uh, now I would just say to LSAC, get to work, make your case. You're about to go into the court of discussion mm-hmm. with both the council and the house. You'll have your opportunity to present it in terms of saying, this is what our comment is. Um, let's hope that your personal relationships and lobbying are, are strong enough to kind of see you through. If not, it's a new world for you guys and we'll, we'll all be there to witness it. Yeah, I know they've got to be feeling well, like they've got a lot to lose here. And potentially they do if they handle this poorly. So I'm rooting for them, as always. Yeah, you and I both would like to see the, you know, the use of the test continue, not only because it's our jobs, but because, like I said before, we like it. I like the test. I find it fun. It's a puzzle to me. I like explaining it to people. And I think that it has value. Do I think it's perfect? Absolutely not. And I've talked about that elsewhere. So we're not saying like, oh, the LSAT's great. It affects some people more positively than others. But as we've said already, we know that there's a way to beat it Mm -hmm. and that you can get around it. And the benefits from having a high LSAT score are tremendous. You can literally have law school almost entirely paid for if you can do well on this test. And that is something that everybody should be focused on. It's something that we preach constantly. So summarizing this whole conversation, if this recommendation does get passed, what's really going to change? And the answer is not a whole lot. We think probably a little bit will change, but even at the law school level, they'll still use it a lot. Uh, There'll still be a lot of benefits to having the test around. The test won't disappear. And that's probably the greatest understanding. So if you're sitting there studying for the LSAT now, or you're thinking about studying for it in the future, uh, for better or worse, no matter what your opinion is of it, you're probably going to be faced with having a standardized test that you need to do well on. So focus on that and don't worry about what the ABA does. And when they start making their proclamations and announcements, I will update it all on Twitter. And I'm sure you and I will write articles about it and maybe even do another podcast. Yeah, this is very much clearly an evolving situation. We're, we're shooting at moving targets here. Um, but, you know, it's kind of what we do. As I've told students, look, if you're listening to this or thinking about this in 2022, business as usual. Take the test, get the best score you can, open as many doors as you can through the traditional paths. If you're listening to this in 2024, well, <laughs> you should probably move a little forward in the podcast catalog because I bet there's an update. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you found this. The right. future person right. who knows researching it, I'm sure we'll come back to it. So that's the gist of it. It seemed like a huge earthquake rippling through the legal market, but I think on further and final analysis at this stage, not sure much is actually going to change. 
All right, John, on that note, we'll call an end to this particular episode. And if you've enjoyed this, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it. And leave us a comment or a rating as well. And if you have any questions about the LSAT, the law school admissions process, or even PowerScore itself, or even, you know, what John and I are going to drink in one of our upcoming episodes, you can send those questions to LSATpodcast at PowerScore.com. So everyone out there, we hope you enjoyed listening. Please stay safe and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.